they give they teach us depending on what we want to do what we want to sign up for but they teach us a lot about plants science and plants man and his environment basically and then early california history because there's a lot of historical structures here then i signed up to be a tour guide for uh grade school kids so for 10 years I gave every Friday during the school year, I conducted school tours in California history, early California history, for third to sixth graders. And they call in, the teachers do, and they reserve times for the tours and they are guided or they can call in anytime and get a self-guided tour if they want. We give them all the information. But I did guided tours. I had to stop that because I started getting gout. So oh. when you get gout, all of a sudden, if you stop a lot, <laughs> it, you know, boom, you can't do a tour anymore. So, so now what I do is I'm a phone docent. <laughs> so I said they call in and they make reservations. Now what I do is I'm on the phones and I talk to the teachers who are interested in getting conducting a tour or bringing their kids. They don't know anything about the Arboretum. I tell them all about what the tour involves, whether it's a plant tour or a history tour. And then I'll arrange them if they are interested. Um, when I graduated, quote unquote, from the docent school, they give us our, our choice of whether we want, we would prefer plant tours or history tours. Well, I immediately figured out if I took plant tours, I'd have some third grader telling me that's not a stamen, that's a pistol, dummy. <laughs> and I wasn't about to subject myself to that. So I took early California history tours because I figured you could be a little faster and looser with history because who's going to prove you wrong? So anyway, we do have a lot of history here and a lot of Native American plants as well as plants from all over the other Mediterranean parts of the world. Uh -huh. So we have plants from Africa, especially the west coast of Africa. We have plants from South America, the west coast of South America. We have plants from the Holy Land, uh, the Middle East, which is a Mediterranean climate. We have uh, uh, plants from around the Mediterranean, obviously, which is the first Mediterranean climate, and then from Southern California. So there are five basic Mediterranean climates in the world, and we have different sections for all of those plants. So we have an Australian section, we have a, a uh, African section, we have a South American section. So you see a lot of different plants. Uh, but we're, we're basically only going to cover today uh, the south end of the Arboretum, which is most of the historical structures. It's 127 acres, and so it would take a long time to cover the whole place. North, that way, is mostly dedicated to plants and, and the different areas, the Mediterranean area. South is where most of the historical structures are. So we're going to kind of concentrate on those. But we will talk about plants on the way, specifically plants that the Native Americans used. Because the Tongva Native Americans lived here on this property uh, thousands of years ago. And they lived here for thousands of years until around 1750 when the Spaniards and the missionaries showed up and screwed everything up. <laughs> well, not real. Mm -hmm. San Gabriel Mission. And one, what they also did was change the name of the local Native Americans. They would recruit them. I think that's a nice word, recruit. Nice. They would recruit them to work at the mission. Now, these were the Spaniards and the Padres. And they would help build the mission. Then they would kind of populate the area around them. But the Spaniards changed the name of the local natives to match the mission they were working on. Therefore, these people became known as the Gabrielinos. Mm -hmm. And you will still see today the Gabrielinos who are a regular authorized tribe, a federal tribe. They don't have a casino yet, but they are a federal <laughs> recognized tribe. But they were, but they were Chumash. They were Chumash okay. and the particular Tongva mm -hmm. part of Chumash. A lot of different uh, branches of Chumash, but the Tongva were one branch, and they populated this area. So they became the Gabrielinos. They were recruited to build the mission. 
and then they were planting areas, but the only people that could have any property ownership or be able to settle on property were those Native Americans, those Tongvas. Well, Hugo Reed married a Tongva lady, so he was given the deed, and the way they got deeds to the property was uh, they had to fence it in, grow some plants, and, and have some livestock and have them uh, in, a, in a specific area where they couldn't, they just didn't roam free. He did all that, Hugo Reed did, so he got the property rights actually from the King of Spain to this area. So he was the first real titled landowner, Hugo Reed. We have a school down the street named Hugo Reed Elementary just close by here. So that's where he lived. And that was in 1718, 55 approximately. The uh, city of LA was founded in 1750 because it was founded at the same time, in fact, a few days after San Gabriel was founded because the, they were working their way. So they found Mission San Gabriel and the next mission they found one day's walk away was the mission in downtown LA called La Reina de los Angeles de, anyway, the, the angels, goes on and on. De Porciuncula is the last bit. Anyway, that, that's being refurbished, but that is a replication of the original structure here, and basically the first, one of the very first structures built in all of the San Gabriel Valley. So that's Hugh, Don Hugo Reed lived right there, and he had... He had all this property before the... Uh, not all of it, not all of it. It grew and grew and grew, and then when in uh, 18, let's see, 18, about 75 is when... Um, Passageway here. Mm -hmm. Passageway. Okay. 1875 oh. is mm -hmm. when um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, Lucky Baldwin bought the property and won parts of it in games of chance and uh, funding banks and then taking over. He ended up, after he bought this, as a basis of his estate, his estate grew to 63,000 acres. Mm. Now to give you an idea how big 63,000 acres is, uh, the city of Arcadia is 11 square miles and that is 7,000 acres. So you can imagine 63,000 acres. So Lucky Baldwin's estate covered what is now Arcadia, Temple City, Monrovia, Sierra Madre, part of Duarte, Baldwin Park, which is named after Lucky Baldwin, and parts of uh, the city of industry. So that was his main estate, and this was the headquarters of that estate. But then he sold it off to different entities uh, and as he always said, I'm not selling land, I'm selling climate. Mm -hmm. The guy was from Ohio, and he ended up falling in love with this place. He act, his headquarters were actually in San Francisco, owned the Baldwin Hotel in San Francisco, which burned down, unfortunately. But this was his headquarters in Southern California. It was a working ranch and farm. He grew everything you can imagine here. And when somebody once asked him, what, what? Don't, what doesn't grow on your property? He said, the mortgage. <laughs> uh, first wife he divorced because he was never home. <laughs> he was always in, in India or someplace. He was all over the place. So she finally divorced him. That's where his first daughter, Clara, her name was Unruh, like Jess Unruh, part of that whole thing. Uh, he divorced her, married another woman uh, named uh, Jenny Dexter, who was the real love of his life. Jenny Dexter bore him uh, his second living daughter. Two other children uh, died who were from uh, UNRWA, but the one daughter that lived was Clara Baldwin. Uh, then, uh, <clears throat> from the second marriage, Lily um, Jenny Dexter, uh, he had an additional daughter named Anita. So Anita Baldwin 
And she's the one who kind of subdivided this place because all of Baldwin's belongings uh, were virtually left to the two daughters, uh, two legitimate daughters, if that tells you anything, uh, but Clara and Anita. And then they both have a big, uh, had big uh, mansions that they built themselves here. But this was going to be his honeymoon cottage for his fourth wife, 16-year-old. Now, this was when he was approaching 60. Oh, no. And he, mar he was married 16-year-old Lily Bennett. Now, that was blessed by her family because her father... Because he had a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because he had a lot of money. And her father, Lily Bennett's father, was actually the, the state architect. He actually designed the Capitol building in Sacramento. So he designed this for his daughter's honeymoon cottage. And that was in 1885. Unfortunately, by the time it was finished, she was too with him and had and took off. Didn't want, didn't want anything to do with Lucky anymore because he was a philanderer and a womanizer. So, but she never divorced him. So she lived, moved to San Francisco lived in his hotel up there and he completely supported her uh, paid for everything but they never really lived together except for one year and never lived in that cottage so the queen anne cottage uh, became a guest house so lucky who lived over in the in the hugo reed adobe but had added on to it uh, that's where he lived and the queen anne was where all the um, well, all the guests came, and it was a very, very popular place for all the socialites of downtown L.A. and Pasadena and San Marino, all the old men. Everybody wanted to come and visit Lucky Baldwin and stay in the cottage. They actually had gondolas in the lake. Walking around. But this is exactly as you see it. Right now is what it looked like back in 1885 when that was built. Those colors, the whole bit. Now when they when they built when they filmed Meet the Fockers and that was the house where the uh, Fockers lived, Queen Anne Cottage, they painted the whole thing brown. So then, but it was in need of a, of a, of a paint job then. So we luckily got them to paint it back in the original and brand new. Uh, Murder She Wrote filmed a bunch of episodes here, but they painted it brown also because and they didn't want all the telltale red and white striping and everything yeah so they changed it uh, and angela lansbury spent a lot of time here filming at this spot all of the all of the tarzan movies were filmed right over in this area uh johnny weissmuller would go swimming in the lake uh they did one scene where they had four crocodiles but they were in cages on the, uh, the edge here. Uh, but of course they film it so you can't tell they're in a cage. Uh, two of them escaped from the cage and went into the water. And the, the word was, the story was, Weissmuller set a new Olympic record <laughs> swimming to get out of that, out of the lake when those two crocodiles were in the lake. Vince, I got a quick question sure. for you to really test your history knowledge. Uh oh. Okay, we know that uh, Ricardo Montalban and uh, the, the wharf with the plane and everything. Hervé Yes. Yeah. And the show ran for like five to six seasons or mm -hmm. something like that. My question I read one time or saw that New York Blue, which the whole show takes place in New York, would go to New York for one week out of an entire year and do all their shots at the same time. Did they do the same thing with this? You got Ricardo here for one week actually, and do everything? Actually, no. They filmed most of them here. However, they did build a replica of this house at Universal Studios uh -huh. lot, but a facade of it. Yeah. So some of the shots were there, but most of the shots, especially all those when the guests are arriving mm -hmm. at, at the beginning yeah. of the show and coming to the place, they were all filmed here. So every single episode was filmed here. But some of them, the some of the makeup shots mm -hmm. that they had to finish up before it showed that week 
were actually filmed on the back lot at uh, Universal Studios. Now, interestingly, any real aficionado can always tell which ones were filmed <laughs> yeah. where, simply because when they built the replica, they reversed the entrance. So you can tell, because if you look and see what side the entrance is there, which I'll show you in a while, mm -hmm. they're reversed in the lot in, in Universal Studios. <laughs> See or do, and they said we have no idea. He wouldn't tell us. He just said, "I'm coming over. Can you have somebody walk me around?" He just so uh, he said, "Okay." So he asked me if I would, and I said, "Sure." And I said, "But but give me an idea of what we're going to do." And he said, "We have no clue." So it was completely impromptu. He shows up with just he and his cameraman, nobody else. That's it. I mean, he has he has no crew. It's just he and his cameraman. In fact, I said, "Oh, you must be Louie. And he said, "No, Louie retired last week. Oh. This was his new cameraman named Cameron, right. and it was his first episode with you. Oh, it was with Cameron and I. And uh, so I said, "Well, what do you want to see?" And he said, "I'm on, I'm doing a three-part series on Lucky Ball." And he said. Later today, we're going to go to the Nethercut Museum because uh -huh. his railroad car is there. Yeah. Well, actually, it's his Clara's railroad car, private railroad car. Uh -huh. Clara Baldwin's Lucky's and daughter. Uh, so it wasn't Lucky's car at all. But he will never have the facts right. All he knew was what he wanted to do, and he did. He was excited about it. He was just excited about it. So, uh, so we walked around and did much what we're doing right now. Just talked about various things, but I did take him inside the queen. Good. Showed him where a lot of movies were filmed, and of course he's a movie buff, so he knew, and he said, you know, I didn't know all that, but he says, I could come back come back and do a whole show on just movies. Yeah. And That's I good. thought to myself, you know, I could too. <laughs> so I actually put together a, a presentation, because I'm, one, I'm with the uh, Speakers Bureau here, mm -hmm. so I put together a presentation uh, on movies that were all filmed here from mm -hmm. the beginning of when we have a history of it right up to that point in time, which was like Meet the Fockers time. Uh, and it's a whole PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. And I give that presentation to garden clubs and mm -hmm. stuff like that. We have five different presentations that we offer for usually honorariums so we can earn money for the... Uh, the volunteer group that does it. So I put together, and we call it Hollywood at the Arboretum. And the the, the genesis of that was Shul Hauser being here. Mm -hmm. And I figured out, you know, if he thinks he can do a whole show on movies, so can I. So we do, and it's a, it's a great, great yeah. presentation. In here. So uh, that's a, that's a norm. That's the main entrance. And around here, you'll be able to look in that room because that's one of the main sitting rooms. So you got, so you got, of the peafowl family, you got peahens, peacocks, and peachicks. Yep. Six, three pair, were brought here by, by Lucky Baldwin from India mm -hmm. in 1883. When he took one of his trips to India, fell in love with a peafowl, brought three matching pair here and put them at the Arboretum. Today, we probably have, they think in the area of five to 600 peafowl in Arcadia. Wow. All of the peafowl in Arcadia, a lot of peafowl in uh, La Cunada Flint Ridge, a lot of peafowl in Palos Verdes Estates. They all came from the original three pair that Lucky Baldwin brought here. Yeah, you know, sure. So yeah, know. everybody yeah. has Lucky Baldwin to thank if they love the peacocks. They don't, though. But they don't. <laughs> Who doesn't? I have in my yard every day at about 5 or 6 o'clock, depending yeah. on the time of year, as it starts getting dark, i probably got 40 or 50 of them oh, in my front yard, my mind. in yeah. my trees. They all go up to the trees at night. They sleep in the trees. Oh. Uh, by the way, typical of the male of these all species, the male is far more attractive oh, than the female. <laughs> That's typical of any species. <laughs> but actually, that is because the 
the peacock is a deadbeat dad. Figures. When they lay the <laughs> lay, lay the eggs, and they are they have eggs, the male struts off and starts courting other females, and when they bring up their tail to show all of their feathers, that's for one of two purposes. That's either a defensive move or it's for mating purposes. But a defensive move is because to a predator, like a, 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 a coyote or anything else, it looks like a thousand eyes looking at it, so they'll raise their feathers and then shake them, the males. And then they'll shake them, it looks like all these eyes, it'll terrify any predator. Anyway, the male takes off and could care less about...